In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Please be seated. We give thanks to our Lord and our God and our Savior for the life that he has given us, that we woke up this morning, amen, amen. that yet again we are able to come to the seat of his mercy, amen. amen. May the Lord our God be merciful unto us. May he guide us in our way that we may become the people that we are called to be. Amen. amen. Good morning. Buckle up. You know, I start with this. People hate church. They do. They do. People hate church. You don't believe me? Look to your right, look to your left, see how empty it is. People hate church. They hate church because they see the irrelevance of church. Church has nothing to do with their daily lives. They see the irrelevance. They hate it because they see the hypocrisy of the church. They see pastors and priests talking about what they don't like and disagree with and then being caught on the news doing the same damn thing that they say they don't like. They see people come into church and they're holier than thou on Sunday mornings, but on Sunday afternoon in the parking lot, they flip you the bird. They hate the judgmental nature. The fact that if you might come into the wrong congregation wearing the wrong set of shoes or the wrong clothes, Somebody's going to have a problem that if you don't know that you're supposed to bow when you say Jesus, somebody's going to have a problem. They hate the bickering and the infighting. They come to church and then they see people who claim to love the Lord and worship together. They see them back and forth over tit for tat over this and that. And as that woman said, ain't nobody got time for that. And that's why the churches are empty. That's why when you look around in your pew, that's why we are empty. And that's why, if I had to be honest with you, and I should since I'm your priest, if I had to be honest with you, that is why I hate church. I can't stand it. I dislike it. Why? Because in church, what we have is a whole bunch of failings and failures and rancor and discord and this and that. And when you talk about it, they say, well, you know, the church is a human institution. The, the church is filled with people. The church is filled with sinners. And so what can you expect? But such an idea is a cop-out. And so if I were to title today's sermon for you, I would say the church is not a human institution. The church is not a human institution. You know, those of us who pledge, and I, I feel good because I got a whole bunch of cues, and let me not say cues, Omega Men in here, there's a difference. Those of us who pledge know that excuses are tools of incompetence. They build monuments of nothingness and bridges that lead to nowhere. And those who specialize in excuses seldom excel in anything else. And when we give ourselves the excuse that the church is a human institution, it's just a body of people coming together, a bunch of sinners coming together, what can you expect? When we give ourselves that excuse, we are displaying our incompetence. We are building monuments of nothingness and bridges that lead to nowhere. And that is why we accept human brokenness in the mighty name of Jesus. 
We accept a so-called church that brings no more healing to the world than either the Democrats or the Republicans. We accept a church that functions no better than, and in many instances, far worse than any other social institution. But the church is not a human institution. In our reading from Leviticus today, the Lord told Moses to go and tell the people, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. When Jesus, in the gospel that was appointed for today, when Jesus finished his, his statement, he said, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. The church is not a human institution. But there's nothing new under the sun because Paul was trying to get the people of Corinth to get to understand the same thing I'm trying to get you to understand today. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 16 and 17, he turns to the Corinthians and he says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. I want you to pay attention to those, that word defiles and that word destroy because when you look at the Greek translation, it is the same word for there. The same word for defile is the same word for destroy. And so if we were to reread that passage, if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God defile. Or, or, if any man destroys the temple of God, him or her, God shall destroy. So why do we accept corruption and human failing as part of the church? And why don't we fear destruction? having accepted corruption in the body of Christ. What do we believe about church? What do we believe? Why do we come? Why do we do this? You see, in the Episcopal tradition and in many of the apostolic traditions, we'll stand up and we'll say the creed. When we finish here, when I finish here before you, we will stand up and we will say the creed, what we believe. And we will say we believe in the apostolic church, one Catholic apostolic church. And because we believe in the apostolic church, we, beloved, should understand the purpose of liturgy. We must understand the purpose of liturgy. And so liturgy is not simply the order of worship. Liturgy is not simply that you have a prelude before the service starts and then you have the processional hymn. And then after the processional hymn, you have the acclamation, you have the gloria, then you have the readings, and then you have the Eucharist, and then you have the dismissal. No! Leadership is... I mean, liturgy is not simply put in place to guard us from a free-flowing chaos that we might see in other denominations. Rather, in the sense of the original meaning of the word, the Greek word liturgia, liturgy is the action by which a group of people become something incorporate. That means they become something together. Liturgy is the action by which a group of people come something in corporate that they had not been 
as a mere collection of individuals. Liturgy, beloved, is the process by which we become the body of Christ. That's why liturgy is a procession. We process in, we process out. We enter as a people coming to the throne and table of grace. We process out as a people emboldened to confront the world. Having feasted on the true light, in the presence of the true light, we process out reflecting the true light. Just like Moses, when he was on Mount Sinai, came down and processed into the midst of the people and his face shone bright with the light of Christ. The liturgy, it is really an anaphora. Anaphora. The word means the lifting up. It is an anaphora. That prayer that we pray, the great thanksgiving, is an anaphora. It is a lifting up. And so in the liturgy, in what we do here on Sunday mornings, we start by announcing our destination. I stand before you, and if you remember back that far, just five, 20 minutes ago, I stand before you and I say, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you reply, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. And when you say that, when we say that, we are not simply naming the kingdom. We are proclaiming that blessed kingdom to be our destination. That is our goal. That blessed kingdom that is now and forever and ever. And so we make our ascent. We make our ascent having proclaimed our destination. We make our ascent through the reading of scriptures, through the singing of songs, and through the chanting of psalms. We make our ascent. We make our ascent through making confession and making peace. Making confession and making peace. Having done those things, we come to the Eucharistic prayer, and I say to you, lift up your hearts. And you say, we have lifted them up to the Lord. Not simply in theory, not simply because the prayer book says you're supposed to say it. Lift up your hearts really and truly. Lift up your hearts into the heavens. And you respond, we have lifted them up to the Lord. We are at the Lord's table. The reason we say we who are many are one because we share in one body and one cup. Is because I say to you, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us make Eucharist. Why? Because it is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere for us to make Eucharist. An Eastern theologian, Alexander Schmemann, in his text for the life of the world, says that the early Christians realized that to become the temple of the Holy Spirit, to become the temple of God, they must ascend to heaven. To become the temple of God, we must ascend to heaven. Not in theory, not figuratively, but we must ascend to heaven. And so the Eucharist is the body of Christ. That's what we say. We give thanks afterwards for having shared in the precious food of his holy body and his precious blood. We believe, that's what we say we believe. Do we believe that? Is it his body and blood or are we just saying that? Through the mystery of faith, what was once bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. It really becomes the body and blood of Christ. Now, I don't get in any arguments about 
transubstantiation and consubstantiation and how it became what and what do the elements look like under a microscope when they change? I don't even care. It is a great mystery that is beyond my comprehension. All I know is that Christ said it, it was so. And because it becomes the real body of Christ, once we take of it, once we eat of it, we become the mystical body of Christ. Somehow, some way, we become the mystical body of Christ. And because we have now become the mystical body of Christ, we manifest the real Christ in this world, leading the world on a Eucharistic journey. The liturgical life of the church that we celebrate in these four walls, the liturgical life of the church becomes yours becomes mine, becomes our liturgical life in the world as the church, as the body of Christ. There is no debate. There should be no debate within you about whether it is symbol or whether it is real because it is both symbol and real. The reality of Christ's presence in the Eucharist is a symbol of who we really are, the body of Christ, the temple of God. And because of the mystery of faith, we are really the body of Christ. And when we are really the body of Christ, we become a symbol of God's kingdom to a fallen world. if what we have is indeed the Lord's Supper, if the Lord's Supper indeed has power, if Holy Communion, if this great Eucharist is really the body and blood of Jesus Christ, then because of the Eucharist, the church is not a human institution. So don't act like one. Let us be more than what the world says that we are. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord and let us make Eucharist. Let us embrace the liturgy within these walls that that liturgy might become a lived liturgy out in the world. And let us show the world that Jesus Christ and those who are found in Jesus Christ have truly overcome the world. Amen. Jobbread.com is home to the online ministry of Father Jobbread. Journey with us through the wilderness to God's promised land. Subscribe now to Jobbread TV and receive all of his videos.